Amen. And our sermon reading is a very simple one, John 16, 33. Uh, John records Jesus' words. And here's what Jesus says, I've told you this so that you might have peace in your hearts because of me, my peace. While you're in the world, you will suffer. But be of good cheer, I have defeated and overcome this world. We're looking at these lies, as I call it, four lies, four falsehoods that really are just perpetuated within the world, and, and they're holding us back. These things, they, they could sound true and uh, even make sense in a fallen, broken world, and yet they don't lead us to the life God has designed for us. So as we begin, if we're going to talk about lies, we have to start with the truth, and the idea of truth. And last week we looked at this where it's John writes for us, God is light in him. There is no darkness at all. This is very symbolic of all that God is. Uh, you know, God is holiness. God is love. God is all these things. But God is truth. In other words, there's no lie. There's no deceit. There's no pretense. There's nothing hidden in God. He is all light and he pours that forth. Then we looked at the idea of what truth is. And truth truly just means an agreement with reality. To be in agreement with reality. So here we are. See, truth begins with God, and it flows from God. And yet last week we learned that we have this adversary. Jesus told us that this adversary, when he speaks in his very natural native tongue and language, it is lies and deceit. In fact, Jesus said there's no truth in him whatsoever, and he is the father of all lies, meaning he is the one who started and perpetuated lies. So whatever lie or deceit or falsehood there is in the world, it can all be traced back to him, the adversary. But this adversary disguises himself as an angel of light, very powerfully deceitful. And the adversary wants us to question God and God's goodness, God's motives, God's love, God's character, for us to not trust in God. Which is always this amazing thing that the father of all lies can deceive us from trusting in God and God's goodness. That the father of all lies can deceive us from not trusting in God's character, who, the one who is light and life and truth. So last week we looked at the very first recorded lie in Genesis 3, right? And I think it's one that, that pops up in all other lies that, that are holding us back in the things that I'm going to be talking about. And that lie was God is holding you, or God is uh, holding out on you. And what I mean by that is, is God said, you can eat of any fruit, don't eat of this one fruit, of this one tree, or you will die. And so the adversary comes and says, you certainly will not die. In fact, if you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You'll be just, just like God. See, God is holding out on you. God doesn't want what's best for you. He's holding back. So you can't trust God. You can't trust God's motives. You can't trust anything about God or God's love. Very interesting idea. But today we're going to look at this problem of suffering. This world is full of suffering. Did you know that? Did you know that there are tens of thousands of children today who will die because of starvation, malnutrition, or preventable disease? This world is full of suffering. Did you know that diseases run rampant? Natural disasters come in and do horrible things. Human-made disasters are a part of them, and they do horrible things in the midst of it. There's loss. There's abuse. There's genocide. We've had the Holocaust and there's others in other nations where millions have been slaughtered. People harming one another. We live in a world where there is suffering. Here's the lie today. The lie is this. If God is good... If God is loving, if God is trustworthy, if God is sovereign or in control, or even if God exists, you see, there would not be suffering. He would not allow suffering, and he would not allow it to continue. Anybody ever heard that before? I hear it a lot. <laughs> people say, I just can't trust, you know, because if there's all this suffering. If God was really good and really loved people, suffering would be done away with. But suffering's still here, so there is no God. You can't trust God. He's not good, which is really kind of rich to me if you think about it, 
Remember, the adversary is the one who brought sin into the world, the very curse of sin into the world. Evil, lies, pain, suffering, death, all came about through the adversary. And now, because he's brought those things into the world, into our existence, now he says, you can't trust God or, or God's goodness or God's love because these things are here. Isn't that rich? Isn't that quite a little lie he has for us? I brought them all in here, but now I'm telling you can't trust God because they're here. And yet we believe. Now, I think this probably comes from uh, a couple of faulty worldviews that we hold, and, and most of us hold these. And number one is this, a faulty worldview that suffering and pain are the ultimate evil. They must be avoided at all costs, and nothing good can come from it. Anybody ever have that feeling within yourself? Mm-hmm. I read a book years ago by Philip Yancey and another doctor is the one who wrote it, and I can't remember his name for the life of me now. And the name of the book is Pain, the Gift Nobody Wants. Anybody ever seen that before? Isn't that a great title? Pain, the Gift Nobody Wants. And what it was is it a book that basically came out and said pain can be beneficial. In fact, it is necessary in some things. You say, how is it? Well, you know what it was? It was a study of leprosy. And all of a sudden, they were finding out that people with leprosy and these diseases were, were losing all of their extremities, their fingers, their toes, and all these things. And they said, well, it must be because they, their, their flesh just kind of rots and falls off. But no, they lost feeling. They could no longer feel pain. And they damaged themselves and injured themselves and did silly things like put their hands right up into a fire to pull something out because they couldn't feel anything. And pretty soon everything fell off. I'm not going to try and get too graphic with you, but in this book was what we learned. People were losing their extremities as they slept at night. And they thought, well, their fingers or toes just must have fallen off. We don't know. You know what was happening? Rats were coming. And because they had no feeling, eating their extremities away. So you know what they did? They made everybody go to sleep with cats, and guess what? They kept their fingers and their toes. Isn't that a most amazing thing? Pain, the gift nobody wants. I know our goal in life is to avoid pain at all costs, right? I mean, literally, let's look at the reality of our nation. We consume vast amounts of painkillers. We're, we're we, we, we have all kinds of intoxicants, all kinds of self-medicating things to deaden pain because we believe pain is the ultimate enemy. Ecclesiastes 7.3. Ecclesiastes is one of those like Proverbs and Psalms where they try and figure out. Really, it's a philosophical thing of why is there evil in the world? Why do we suffer? Why do good people have bad things happen? Why do bad people have good things happen? And here's what he writes for us. He says, sorrow is better than laughter because a sad face is good for the heart. You say, well, how would that happen? There's just no way. That's not reality. And yet it is. Sorrow, pain, suffering gives us a different perspective in life, I guarantee you. In the struggle of suffering, things get addressed, don't they? In the struggle of suffering, life changes come. Adjustments are made. We turn to God. We turn to God's peace and strength. We rely upon God. We grow closer to God in ways that we never would have if everything were happiness and comfort. Anybody know what I'm talking about today in the, in the midst of struggle and pain and sorrow and suffering? We learn more about ourselves and about life and about God than we ever would have if everything just would have been happiness and comfort and all goody, goody, good. That's just reality of life. See, I think another faulty view that we have is we put way too much focus on the present world as if this life is all there is. I live in this present moment, and that's all I'm consumed with, and so everything is focused in on this one thing. But the Scripture tells us, like Ecclesiastes 3.11, that God has put eternity in the hearts of people, eternity for us. We forget that God's kingdom is eternal and that our time in a fallen, broken world is temporary. You see, the kingdom of God is all important. It's our true home. It's what's eternal. That's why Jesus says in, in Mark 8, he says, what good is it to gain the entire world and everything be perfect right here and lose your soul, forfeit your soul, which is about eternity and where we are and where we're supposed to be focusing. Paul likens it to this. I like this. 2 Corinthians 4, he tells us we are treasures in jars of clay. 
I like that idea. Jars of clay, easily broken, very mundane. Not, they, they just, but we have treasures, this, this eternal treasure of a spirit and a soul. Every one of us created in the image of God. We are treasures in these jars of clay that are, that are going to break and, and break down and fall apart. And we know it. In fact, he gets to the end in verse 16 and 18, and here's what he tells us. Therefore, we don't lose heart, though outwardly, those jars of, of clay, we are wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us the eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So what do we do? Here's your advice. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. What is unseen is eternal. You see the idea of what Paul's trying to share with us? But in the meantime, what do we do with suffering? Here's an answer I got long ago. I went to a small Christian uh, school uh, here in Indiana named Taylor University. Anybody ever heard of Taylor University? Uh, Taylor University, I must have to do a little shout out here. They're always in the top uh, universities in uh, the Midwest, and they are, I just found out again, number one, rated number one by U.S. News and World Report as a regional college university in the whole Midwest. Isn't that awesome? They're good school. But the interesting thing about Taylor is that it's a liberal arts college, which means some places you go to like a state school, you say, here's my major, and you, you just take your major. But in liberal arts, you got to take everything, and let me tell you, everything is involved. And one of those great classes I got to take was philosophy. Yeah, it was. Actually, it was a pretty good class. And in philosophy, this question came up. Hey, if God is good or loving or trustworthy or in control, wouldn't he do away with, with suffering? I mean, when that... And the professor gave me this most amazing answer, and I still live with it today, and I think it's, I think it's true. You ready for it? Here it is. We have to trust that God created the best of all possible worlds. Could we trust that? That God created the best of all possible worlds, which is a world of choice. See, God could have created a world where everybody had to be a robot. No one could have had a choice in the matter. We have to love God. We have to love people. We have to do good. Nothing can ever happen. But you see, that's not true love. So he created a world and where you could have true love, which is about choice, where you could truly choose to do the right things, which is about choice. And God said, I've created this world. It's awesome. And yet because I've got this, this idea of choice in the midst of this so that you can live the way I want you to, that also means there's a possibility of choosing poorly. There's a possibility of rebellion and rejection. There's a possibility of evil and the curse of sin. And there's a possibility of deceit and lies and falsehood and suffering and pain and death. But we trust that God's created the best of all possible worlds and that God understood. It's powerful. I mean, let's be honest. We think nothing bad should ever happen to us, well, especially me, right? I mean, nothing bad should ever happen. If something does bad and it happens that's bad, we say, why, God, why, right? We cry out. Well, here's the crux of the matter as we get through this. You can allow suffering to move you to a point of bitterness, self-pity, unbelief, a lack of trust of God, denying God's sovereignty and goodness and love, even denying that God exists, or in the midst of suffering, you can allow it to help you find God, trust in God, rest in God, find healing and comfort in God. I know often our mindset is that God's number one concern in life number one concern in life is my comfort, my peace, my lack of pain, and my happiness. Anybody ever felt that way before? I know. We, yeah. It'd be great, wouldn't it? God's number one concern in your life, conform you to the image of Jesus so that we would live the lifestyle of Jesus. And you know what the lifestyle of Jesus had with it? Suffering. Oh. I see. See, God gives us a promise. And if you get nothing else, hold on to this promise right here of 2 Corinthians 1. Praise be to God, Father of Jesus, the Father of compassion, and the God of some comfort, does it say? No, all comfort. Who comforts us in some of our troubles? All 
of our troubles so that we can comfort others, even with that comfort we've received. If you can remember this, this is a big step in understanding suffering and what we can do with suffering in a fallen, broken world as we wait for the consummation of the kingdom of God. So let's start here with the basics as we get started, because this is, and I'm sorry, you know, this is going to be a long serve. You'll get home by the time the football games start, I promise, probably. Um, no, but it, it is, it's a long, how do you talk about suffering? And, and I, there's, there's just information here. We, we need to have this. But we're going to start right here with the basics of it all. And the basics is what Jesus told us and what we read already. In this world, you're going to have suffering. That's just life. But be courageous, because I have overcome this world. See, Jesus doesn't write off suffering as an illusion that we can just shed like other religions, if we can just get rid of this illusion. He, he doesn't treat it trivially, but he makes it clear. Suffering is a reality, it's inevitable, it's universal, and God does not always shield us from suffering. That's a reality and a fact. If we can get a hold of that, that's going to help us a lot. So what do we do with suffering and pain in the meantime? I think some great answers come from a man by the name of Lee Strobel. I don't know if you know who that is. Um, he's a pastor, a Christian apologist, uh, talking. He used to be a, an atheist. Now, Lee Strobel has written a book called The Case for Christ. Um, he was the legal affairs editor for the Chicago Tribune in the 1980s, and uh, he's an atheist at that point. And what happens is he learns that his wife decides to convert to Christianity, and this brings con a bunch of conflict into the marriage, if you can imagine an atheist and a Christian trying to get along now. And he begins this two-year effort to disprove Christianity. He interviews leading Christian scholars, giving them a chance to defend their views. He studies the scripture. He really goes into this thing because he truly thought his wife had joined a cult, and, and he loved her and wanted to rescue her from this cult called Christianity. Okay, isn't that amazing? He gets to the very end, and here's what he says. It would take more faith to maintain my atheism than to become a Christian. And so he becomes a Christian. And now he's an apologist, understanding his thoughts were, because there's suffering in the world, there cannot be a God that exists. And that changed to, in the midst of a wonderful, beautiful God who's created things perfectly, um, they're suffering, and we got to deal with it. So here's some truths that he gives about suffering that I think combat the lie. Now, what's the lie? Remember the lie. If God is good, loving, trustworthy, sovereign, or truly exists, he would not allow suffering or for it to continue. The first truth is this. God did not create evil or suffering. God stands alone. God can stand alone for all eternity past. God has stood alone. But evil and suffering cannot stand alone because they are simply opposites of the nature of God. You see, in Genesis 1, God creates, and it's good, and it's perfect. But God has always existed in, in, in eternity past as what we know as Trinity, the triune God, Father, Son, Spirit. And in the midst of this, they have relationship, and, and there is love in the midst of that relationship. And God wants us in the midst of creation to understand and have love. But you see, God wants, in, our, in, in his desire for us to experience love, we have to understand love always has a choice. We can't be forced to love somebody, but love is a choice to do so. So God must have foreseen the possibility of evil. He must have seen the, foreseen the possibility of, of, of disobedience, of suffering, but recognized the benefits of choice and free will to love and be obedient outweighed the cost. Isn't that an amazing thought? So in Genesis 3, we understand the adversary comes in. He introduces sin. Humanity chooses poorly. Original sin then comes in, it taints this perfect world. There's disobedience, there's rebellion, there's evil. There's this thing called sin now, and the curse of sin, and the curse of sin brings with it suffering, pain, death, and loss. But here's one reason why I believe God allows suffering and doesn't just intervene and make it all go away, because God doesn't want to rob us of our choice and free will, because he knows choice and free will is how we truly love God, how we truly love others, and how we do what is right. And he will not take that away from us. 
I truly believe that God is seeking your love and that God loved us enough to give us free will, which means the possibility to choose good and to love God or also the possibility to not. But I believe even in the midst of suffering, God is asking us to choose love and to choose to trust God in the midst of it. Number two, man, whatever it is, God can use it for good. Suffering isn't good. It's hard. It's nasty. It's a part of the curse of sin. Yet God can and will use it for good. He will build character with it, and he will give spiritual growth with it. And this is the scripture that I've used over and over, Romans 8, 28. For we know that God causes all things to work together for good, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Not that God causes everything, but God causes things to work together for good out of our love. We're called to his purpose. Could we trust that even when we don't like what we're in? I don't like the suffering. Yet can I trust that God can make something good come out of that? I can. Because God is amazing that he can use pain and suffering to bring us to God, to reveal his, his character and his nature and his peace and his comfort for our betterment. You know, C.S. Lewis, who was another person like Lee Strobel, atheist, decided I'm going to prove Christianity wrong, got into the Bible, talked with other people, and decided, ooh, it's true, and became, it became his life. He wrote a book called The Problem of Pain, and here's his quote. He says, pain insists upon being attended to. Anybody recognize that before? Pain must be attended to. It insists upon it. <laughs> uh -huh. He says, God whispers to us in our pleasures. I'm here. I know you enjoy life. I'm here. God speaks to us in our conscience, but God shouts to us in our pain. It's the megaphone that arouses the world. I know, a deaf world. You see, in speaking about suffering. Here's my question. Is God speaking to you in your suffering right now? Is he saying, come, find my comfort. Come, draw close to me in the midst of this. Come, let me use it for your good. It's tough. So number one, God's not the creator of evil. Number two, suffering isn't good, but God will use it for good. And number three, I just call this suffering is temporary. It will not go on forever. And the God of grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a while will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. We live in a fallen, broken world on a cosmic scale. There's suffering, pain, and death, and it's universal, and we know it. But there is a day coming when God will rectify the issue of evil and suffering, and it will be ended for good. There's a day coming when God will judge evil. He will restore and heal all that has been affected by the curse of sin. And life will be as it was designed to be without sin's curse interfering with it. It's the promise that he gives like Revelation 21 and I heard a voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with people and he will live with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death, mourning, crying, pain. The old order of things has passed away and the one who is seated on the throne will say, I'm making everything new. And God will do this. But we ask, well, why aren't you doing it now? Why wait, God? What's the delay? 2 Peter 3.9 tells us that. He writes, God is not slow in keeping his promise like we think of being slow. He's not slow. He's patient. He doesn't want anyone to perish. <laughs> he wants everybody to come to this point of, of repentance, everyone to come to this point of understanding of who God is and what God has done for us in the life of Jesus and to bring us to that point. Is God saying today, come to me. <laughs> In the midst of it all, just come to me. Number four, this is a tough one at times to hear, but this is truly about our hope. This is our hope. Our hope is that our present sufferings will pale in comparison to the glory we live in for eternity. 
I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing even, Paul says, to the glory that will be revealed in us when that time comes. Now, I say this is hard to hear sometimes because when you're in the middle of suffering and pain, um, hearing that, oh, sometime in the future it'll all be good doesn't really cut the mustard, does it? But it's a hope we can hold on to and grab a hold of in the midst of this. Just like he wrote 2 Corinthians 4. Don't lose heart. Outwardly, yes, we are wasting away, but inwardly God is at work in our lives day by day. And these light and momentary troubles, he calls them, they don't seem light and momentary all the time. They seem painful and hard, don't they? Yet they're achieving an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we've got to fix our eyes on this hope, not on just what's seen in my present moment and what I feel, but a hope of where eternity lies and what that's going to be for me with God. And that's where I put my hope and my, my focus. Because this is our hope, our future, our true home. And I know we say, my, my suffering stinks, God. It's bad. I don't know how much more I can take. I know. When you're in the middle of it, it's bad. I'm not trying to gloss over your pain or your suffering. And I don't think God ever does either. I'm just trying to offer some hope in the midst of it. Do you need some hope today? <laughs> Would you make a firm commitment to trust God, to rest in God's hope, to focus anew on what is unseen and not just what is seen? Because the end of it is this. It always comes down to our choice. We can become bitter and angry because of suffering. We can, we can doubt God. We can move toward unbelief. We can believe that the lie of suffering proves that God doesn't truly love us, that God can't be trusted, even that God doesn't exist. God's just not powerful enough to be at work in my life because I'm still suffering. Or we can allow it to help us turn to God, to find God's peace, God's comfort, God's presence in our life, God's comfort and hope and rest to draw us into deeper belief, recognizing that God is present with us in the midst of the suffering and gives us grace upon grace upon grace in our lives. It's a peace for today, and it's a hope for tomorrow. Because really the final verdict is that God's answer to suffering simply isn't to ignore it. It's not to gloss over it. It's not to just cover it, but it's to truly participate in it, take it head on, and conquer it. Here's what Lee Strobel writes, and this is, this is powerful. God's ultimate answer to suffering isn't an explanation. It's the incarnation. It's what we're going to celebrate here in just a couple of weeks that God himself said, I will be born as a person and suffer the things that you've suffered so that I can help you out of that. That's his answer. Suffering is personal and it demands personal response. See, God's not some distant, detached, disinterested deity. He entered into our world and personally experienced our pain and our suffering. Jesus is present at the lowest places of our lives. He says, are you broken? He was broken for you. Do you feel rejected? He was despised and rejected. Do you cry out that sometimes, God, I just can't take it anymore? He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with suffering, and he cried out in a garden, God, I can't take it. Take this thing from me. Have you been betrayed? He was sold out. Are you suffering loss? Man, Jesus gave up everything. He left heaven itself to live in this fallen, broken world. Did he descend to the worst that this world has to offer? Yes, he did. And from the depths of a Nazi death camp, Corey Ten Boom writes these words, and I think they are so powerful. No matter how deep our darkness he is deeper still. Every tear we shed becomes his tear. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he rescues those whose spirits are crushed. Would you take just a few moments as we are going to have this last song and just come, and you can even come to this altar if you need to, to come and find comfort, peace, hope, healing, 
uh, just give yourself to God and say, whatever it is the suffering is, Lord, I, wanna, I just want to draw closer to you and I want you to make something good in, it, in my life, whatever that might be.